everyone a very good evening and welcome uh hope you all have your coffee and tea mugs full for an engrossing one one and a half hours of our first of its kind edition of accessibility workshop today we have with us two of our front end architects gautam and siddharth who will be interacting with me during the course of this entire session we'll start off with a quick introduction about ourselves uh, letting know about our experiences with accessibility So hello, my name is Selish Raghun. Uh, I'm a senior director technology with Cubis Sapien. It's been close to 16 years with the organization now, and I've been a front end technologist slash accessibility evangelist for well over a couple of decades now. Uh, and my experience with accessibility and the challenges surrounding it started right during my schooling days, uh, where I had a fellow friend who was suffering from polio and had braces on his legs. So every time he had to walk around to different classrooms or go to a different building. it would be a task of its own with no infrastructure to support like elevators or ramps and only stairs to use we saw him struggle day in day out with the basic movement in and around the school premises now coming to my college days uh, i used to assist in writing exams for my visually challenged seniors and i've been always been around with uh, people with disabilities through my growing years and cut to my professional days and not so long ago I had sent out an email for a gaming competition across the org and part of as part of the you know sports council setup that we have. I promptly got a response back from one of my colleagues say, stating that I'm visually challenged and I cannot make any sense of the email that you have sent. That's when I realized that as individuals how easy it is for us to take things for granted or just assume that what we are doing will cater to one and all. while this journey of accessibility evangelist has been with me for you know a little over a couple of decades like i said it kind of hit me hard in the very recent past and i have posed that i have written a few blogs taken a few sessions and i'm doing my best to you know pass on the message of importance of accessibility to one and all uh that's about me i'll probably hand over to sid when sid if you can share your experience and journey with accessibility uh and we can move on from there so what do you say thank you thanks alesh uh, good evening everyone i hope everyone is safe and sound and have joined this session from the comfort of your homes i am siddharth uh, i have been part of this wonderful organization for close to 6 years now i am currently working as a front end architect contributing to projects in retail and hospitality space it it really warms me to see so many people interested in this topic and me being able to share my journey around how i started uh, realizing the importance of accessibility out in the real world so i'm really happy uh, personally i have been lucky enough to have mentors and peers who kept on encouraging me right from my initial days to inculcate accessibility in my day to day workflow and looking at the positive impact it has on people's lives out there it was not a hard habit to develop uh, but there is this one story which never fails to inspire me you know you know it kicks in that instant motivation within me and i would love to share that with everyone here and hope it has the same positive impact as it had on me um i heard this story from my aunt who is a systems architect in the us so she has a friend who is an accessibility advocate and due to a spinal injury in her childhood uh she was a wheelchair user herself mm -hmm. so one fine day she returned from the court triumphant in an accessibility lawsuit uh, which she filed against some big organization there Uh, but despite the win she was not that happy um, she seemed pretty awful so my aunt inquired on why she seemed upset despite winning the case she said that on her way to the court she was waiting at a bus stop for transport to arrive mm -hmm. uh, the first bus arrived and the driver said that he didn't uh, he was already running late he was behind the schedule so he could not pick her up hmm. okay uh, the next bus came in but there was no ramp in it so she had to skip that as well then the third bus came in uh, and the driver said that he was new and he didn't have much info on how to use the ramp so she had to skip the third one as well now it was almost close to an hour since this entire uh, situation started uh, there were some kids nearby playing uh, who were noticing her plight of not being able to board the bus so let me take a quick 3 second pause here for everyone to ponder upon what might have happened next just have a quick thought around it 
Well, said the way I look at it, if there were kids playing, they've seen her struggle for the last one hour. Probably they would have helped her get into the bus no matter what, whenever the next bus came, or probably dropped her to where she wanted to go herself. I was I was personally hoping for that as well, Salish, that I would get to hear that statement. Uh-huh. But what I heard next, I was literally not prepared for that. And to my horror, that lady was mugged by those kids in the broad daylight. Wow. Okay. So I was I was speechless and I could literally feel a chill down my spine after hearing that. Even now, I, I don't have enough words to describe this entire situation further. But then my aunt's friend told her something very simple yet super powerful. So our community, the web community that we are so proud to be part of is the only space where we can people, where we can enable people with disabilities or impairments to have accessible environments. So to elaborate further on this, there is nobody stopping us from writing or designing our work in an accessibility friendly manner. But if you want to implement such solutions in the real life out there, like public places, parking spots, hotels, private places, anything as in out there, anywhere, it's just not that simple. You have numerous challenges and hurdles uh, which might come up like cost related issues, timing issues, permissions, Mm -hmm. and number of hurdles which might come up. So that, that, but we have a free hand to help people go through pleasant and meaningful experiences. So that statement still resonates in my head and probably keeps me motivated on spreading this message of incorporating accessibility and inclusivity in my day-to-day activities. So that is one incident which keeps me going always. So, wow. yeah. Right. Thanks for that. That is actually a very, very powerful story. And it kind of also brings a very different side in perspective of humans, right? True. Uh, in one place, we want to help go do everything possible to help individuals. Uh, on the other place, we find an advantage spot and we kind of mug individuals, right? And right. I guess, like you said, you know, as developers, uh, if you are building applications which are not accessible, I mean, uh, sounding crude, but we could equate ourselves to muggers, right? Because we are stealing the rights of others to have, you know, equal access to the web. Definitely. But yeah, great, great insight, uh, Sid. Thanks so much. Uh, Gautam, do you want to quickly share your journey as well? Sure. Thank you, Salesh. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Gautam, Senior Manager Experience Technology with Publicis Sapient. I'm a JavaScript specialist and a front-end architect. I have been involved in front-end, uh, developing front-end experiences for last 14 years. I go by a Twitter handle, Null is Object. My first encounter with accessibility was during an interview where I was asked as a developer how I help improving the lives of people with disabilities. This question left me puzzled as back then I had no answer for this. I was totally unaware of the challenges that people with disability face while interacting with their surroundings. This conversation stayed stuck with me and triggered a series of thoughts, which led me to dive further into the world of accessibility. And there has been no looking back since then. I have actively participated in workshop and conferences wherein I tried to inculcate and spread my learnings throughout this time. My goal since then has been to deliver beautiful experiences and reducing the barriers for the people with diverse abilities. So that's about me and over to Salesh who has some interesting activity for all of us. Right. Thanks, Gautam. Uh, well, three of us, three different experiences that has led us to evangelism of accessibility. That's that's kind of interesting. Uh, so let's jump right in. And before we go ahead with the discussion, I probably have a small activity for all our participants, right? Describe accessibility in one word. What is the first word that comes to your mind or what are the words that you associate accessibility with? All right, we have some really technical users experiencing POUR4 and stuff like that. Easy to approach, equality, all right, inclusion. Okay, approachability, super. So yeah, ease of use is what is standing out. That's actually pretty interesting, okay. Right. Inclusion, available for all, able to reach. Hmm. Yeah, we are we are kind of getting closer to the textbook definition of what accessibility is. So that's that's actually going to help us 
uh, with our next few slides as we get into the conversation and you know mm. kind of also bring in the mindset of how accessibility is perceived or what we understand of accessibility and how it really translates out right so but these are these are all fantastic words all right let's get to the next one um okay we'll probably wait for 20 seconds more let's hit the 200 benchmark uh, <laughs> like a good number for now <laughs> but it feels really good to see all those nice sounding words on the screen right <laughs> yeah i mean that those are the words we resonate with so well right yeah, so yeah. actually nice yeah so this is the next question uh if you do test for accessibility of these what do you use or if you are completely new to accessibility i am hoping i don't get what are you talking about as one of the answers um ah damn okay but uh, that's nice <laughs> <laughs> right i'm hoping people we have enough for everybody to take away from this session then and what's interesting to see uh, salesh is a lot of people are using screen readers like jaws and nvda oh, to so test amazing it. to see yes so true yeah all right so let's move to my favorite question of the lot um and i'm hoping i see some of the answers that i'm wishing to uh, <laughs> but yeah let's go with this <laughs> oh wow Oh, you have. This is, oh, this is wow. super happy. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. All right. I'm just hoping I see one more percentage go up in the rest of the three, and then we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> For my own selfish reasons, there. But yeah, great. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, doing this, everyone. Uh, we will come back to Menti, so don't close your Menti screen. uh and let's get on with the conversation and i guess with with that kind of uh, q and a i think said we should probably do the launch of our site right away right uh what do you think oh you mean the when with the flashy ui we built yesterday the flashy colors awesome css that animation i see the one yeah i mean the uh, one we had you know all the works in terms of animations and stuff that's exactly what i'm talking about and gotham since you also haven't seen it and you're the only one who can talk of the rest of the population yeah. why don't you share your perspective on this side uh sorry salesh i think there is some technical glitch because all i see is just a black screen well right that's that's by design gotham uh, now the thought behind that is that you know the reason why we exactly wanted this is to think of a site or an application that has all the fancy ui all the flashy work all the awesome you know jigs that we can think of but it can't be used by everyone it is in compliant it is in accessible and i probably believe if you don't have a site which is accessible and usable by the rest of the population it might as well be as good as not having one right so seeing a blank screen for a person who's visually challenged and not being able to access the site this is exactly the experience that the person has so we kind of hit the nail on the head on where we wanted to get started with which kind of also you know leads to this right kind of quote that we heard in one of the conferences which says you know we use sites and stuff like that nobody said that that is the reason we would want to go for it right no one visits sites applications only for its visual non functional appeal so to say which kind of you know helps us get into our core topic right what does accessibility mean to begin with and if you were to look at a classic textbook definition if you go by what wikipedia or what you search on google these are the two big things that come up right looking at accessibility is the design of products devices services or environments for people it's kind of made sense kind of you know resonates with all the cloud word cloud that we saw Uh, but what i find interesting is the second part of it which says accessibility can be viewed as the ability to access and benefit from some system and the words ability to access is something that intrigues me a lot uh because when we are talking about ability to access i genuinely want to question that when we talk about accessibility whose ability are we trying to question here is it the ability of the person trying to access an environment or are we questioning the ability of the person trying to provide that environment for somebody to access right slight difference in the meanings of the two 
uh, to explain better, let's look at a use case, right? Uh, let's say the exercise that we'll want to try and run is I need to go from point A to point B. The easiest way to go through that is to catch a train, right? And we, we look at this, right? We get to the platform, we get on the train, we get to our destination, get off it, right? People can walk in, wheelchair people will have ramp to get into. It is a perfect use case. Nobody's talking about accessibility. Nobody's talking about challenges. It's a simple use case. There's a train, people want to travel, people are traveling, right? Now, suddenly what changes in this entire ecosystem? Let's look at the second part of the problem. We have, if you look in the first left, we have a, you know, elderly person trying to get down and struggling with it because the height of the, you know, the train entrance and the platform is pretty big. So the person struggles. The, on the right, what you see is the gap between the door and the platform is pretty huge. So the person on the wheelchair is trying to figure out how do I get in. The one in the middle, although it says the compartment is designed for the disabled, there is no ramp for the person to get in. So the person is struggling and figuring out how do I even enter, right? So what is fundamentally difference between the two? It is the same people, it, you know, with the first example, the people could enter. In the second example, people can't enter. And suddenly the label of being disabled is being put on the people who are trying to access it. Whereas the people are the same, what has changed is the environment around them. So why do we label people as disabled and not the environment, right? On similar lines, um, again, you know, one of the conferences, I heard this other debate, which I kind of, you know, perfectly resonated with. And I'll go back to the third question that we were discussing where we saw a blob of colors. Some people saw 66, 25. Some people saw nothing in 25. Majority saw 56 and 25. Now, if you look at it, all the answers are right. And the reason why I say that is with my personal experience, I am colorblind, right? I don't see a number in the first blob. I only see the 25. If I really strain my eyes, knowing that majority of the people are saying 56, I can kind of roughly make out there is a blur shape of 66 somewhere, right? The other extreme is they all see a blob of colors. They don't see any numbers. Now, this is a classic case of color blindness. Now, again, I look at my color blindness as impairment, right? Because if you give me a site which is built with high contrast colors, I will be able to use it like the train example that we have on top, right? Which is perfectly accessible by everyone. But suddenly, if you give me a site which does not have contrasting colors, right? Uh, where I don't know what to click or the only indicators of a good and bad is through colors, I will struggle to use the application. Uh, but what would happen is people would call me disabled instead of, you know, people who built that to be, you know, called out to be as disabled. So the message or the statement that we are trying to make is people only have impairments. People are not disabled. And this is what I believe that we as developers or we as people who are trying to provide environment to these people with impairments are the one who make them disabled, right? Uh, I saw this message kind of, you know, perfectly made sense to me. And hence, I thought I'll share it with the rest of the folks as well. Now, talking about impairment, disability, what we also try and perceive is the solution that we provide is kind of equal to all. Everybody, we want to give the same kind of experience to everyone. Uh, but maybe the same kind of experience is not practically possible. Let's, let's look at another example, right? Um, Let's look at the first case where what we are trying to do is provide cycles to everyone to go from point A to point B. So we buy four cycles, exactly the same height, exactly the four, same dimensions, give it to four different people. Now, if you look at what's happening here, right? The first person is a small kid and he is struggling to get even to the pedal. So he can't ride the bike. The third person is really tall and he's struggling to, you know, pedal the bike as well because his legs are getting stopped. The one on the left is on a wheelchair, can't even move, can't even get on the cycle. So being equal is not necessarily the solution to, you know, accessibility or being right to everyone. What we are looking at is having equity, which basically says you need to identify a solution that is more tailor-made for the kind of people that are available or kind of people that are trying to use a particular service, right? The intent here is going from point A to point B not going on a cycle. So we need to understand what are we trying to solve, not what are we trying to solve it with. And that kind of, you know, hidden message is where all the answers are. 
and kind of you know i've been going on and on for a while so i'll probably bring you in said and uh, you know since we were talking about comparison of words uh, one of the things that we discussed in the last couple of days was around compliance versus accessibility mm. uh, why don't you right. step in and share your thoughts around you know these two words to be honest selesh this is one of the biggest myths out there and a tricky one to address as well because compliance and accessibility are two words which people often confuse to be the same that is usually the case as in we have yeah. seen it in past as well so let's try to debunk this myth using the image which we see on our screens right now yeah so the idea of having ramps in public places where we have long stairways and stuff is a much needed one and a welcome one for that as in people will love to have this uh so selish personally what do you think of this design oh uh, i think it's better than having only stairs uh, at least the person has thought of the compliance that you know giving all the stairs you are basically not letting people with wheelchairs get on it so there is some thought got into it gone into it so it's compliant yeah, i don't know about accessibility but yeah at least it looks compliant to me almost there <laughs> yeah. but if you observe closely there are some obvious flaws as well there Mm -hmm. so the first and foremost one which is pretty evident is that there is no railing going along your ramp pathway oh yeah okay right and second if you observe the inclination of the ramp is also too steep for an independent wheelchair user to go up the ramp so if the person gets tired midway then he or she will come rolling down the ramp yeah so one misstep on the ramp and it causes you more harm than benefit right So what we get from this is that design wise on paper this might be a compliant one with all the accessible standards but in reality this is not accessible hmm so That's on the same lines i recall an incident as well so around 3 to 4 years back uh, i was working with a client from the hospitality space so we were in charge of revamping their entire web experience and also we had a very specific requirement of the website to be aa compliant i still remember after completing all the development work we ran the website through lighthouse wave tool html validator linter i don't even recall some of the tool names now and we got excellent scores to back us up also hmm. but to our surprise when uh, we saw a huge number of defects being logged once the uat phase the user acceptance phase phase was completed by the client mm. so we researched further we dug <clears> deep <throat> as to what were all these defects about we had uh, excellent scores we were aa compliant what went wrong so mm. that's when we found out that all the defects were around your screen readers and tabbing order of the elements on the page <laughs> that is something which we didn't even think of so the defects were around like screen reader not reading the elements inside a pop up window uh, users not able to tab through your custom drop down elements uh, check box labels were not being read by the screen reader mm. or the users were not able to select dates from our range picker using the keyboard so these are just few of them that i recall on top of my head but yeah these were few and mm. by the time we had fixed all those defects <coughs> we had learned a very important life lesson and that was all these automated tools present out there which certify whether your website or app is accessible or not they do not paint the actual picture that's true it just tells you whether you are on the right path or not probably the first step towards building an accessible experience that's mm. it so that is the reason we keep emphasizing on the fact that accessibility involves proper harmony between three things so it all starts with design mm -hmm. then comes the code or execution part of it and finally the content of your app is what ties everything together only <clears throat> when all these three aspects are properly thought out and executed in tandem with each other we can dream of achieving a truly accessible and inclusive experience well yeah that's that's so rightly put and in fact i resonate with this slide so much uh, you know i've been you know in my past few conferences talking about these three uh, importance of these three steps uh because needless to say now that we've spoken about color blindness you know that's one of the important aspects that the design team brings in mm. uh plus what it also brings in is uh you know the subtlety of creating components or the subtlety of creating form with you know native elements rather than trying to create custom ones 
right. and making it difficult for people to you know create an accessible environment for others right True. content for me is one of the biggest pains right i mean when we look at compliance when we look at checking the alt tag that is what most tools check <laughs> and if you have the alt tag you know they'll say that you are brilliant you have a score of 100 not realizing what you've put inside the alt tag does not have any relevance what with what it actually denotes so what it can check for is code compliance not necessarily the content compliance this only comes with you know real testing right so and so the classic example is also when we look at a e-commerce you know a product landing page you have your classic buy now button right and you know every time i use a screen reader all i hear is buy now buy now buy now not realizing what am i buying to begin with right <laughs> there is no correlation between the buy now button and the product itself so right. yeah i mean unless all three come together i don't think you know the entire experience can be called accessible it can be compliant but clearly not accessible exactly um, but yes it this also brings us to a you know a, a very different point of view where when we go and propose or when we go and have a conversation with our clients or our leads saying accessibility is an important element and we definitely need to make sure that the apps that we build or the experience that we are building needs to be accessible right mm. uh, one of the common throwbacks is uh, well you know what not too many of our people are accessibility compliant or it's an internal application uh, i don't think we'll need to look at accessibility what is your point of view around that mm, that's true selish that happens almost in 99% of the times mm. so this line here the way i say it it has become more of a mindset than just a simple statement or a fact mm. and on top of that one thing that really disappoints me is the stereotype that people have built in their heads True. so hearing the word disabled <laughs> the first and probably the only thing that comes to their mind are wheelchair users and i don't blame them for that because if you observe their logo of the uh, disabled users closely it's literally a person sitting in a wheelchair <laughs> oh yeah and that's how the perception of the people has also taken shape right so do you really think it's fair to say that only the people using a wheelchair are disabled Good if that is the case what about the 95% of the other users who fall into the same category but are usually ignored so that's really unfair uh, let's look at some glaring facts around the number of physical and hidden disabilities users it's really surprising some of them oh yeah some actually equate the size of few nations right uh, yeah some actually compared to the entire european union some get compared <laughs> to brazil some twice as big as canada so right okay so on the on the same lines i recall one example uh, in 2018 uh, there was a survey conducted by one of the retail giants in us and canada mm mm-hmm. uh, what they did was they installed this new checkout related product in select stores and observed close to 10000 people to observe their to understand their behavior and interaction with the new checkout machine that they were soon going to launch mm-hmm. so apart from the study of the new checkout machine they made a very alarming observation as well so out of the 10000 people that visited their stores 900 users were people with disabilities 900 oh okay and out of this 900 only 50 of them were physically disabled like the ones pretty evident to your naked eye which you might relate to from the logo conversation we just had yeah rest of the 850 users were all from various segments like color blind blurred vision uh, people with spinal problems which uh, did not permit them to select items from the higher shelves mm-hmm. uh, or people with cognitive limitations since there was this huge volume of products around them mm-hmm. it was really difficult for them to focus on the product the one product that they actually needed mm. so these numbers in themselves are very worrying but the one fact or the one uh, statement which came out of all this was really horrifying and shocking it is that out of this 900 users only 15 users 15 were able to complete the checkout process and take home their desired set of products wow okay <laughs> only 15 out of 900 yeah so i was literally speechless looking at this number because what people fail to understand is that while turning a blind eye to these users you are also missing out on 8 trillion dollars worth of spending potential which is in no ways a small number <laughs> that is so true and with an aging population this number is only bound to increase as the need for assistance from surroundings will also increase even to perform your day to day tasks right 
So what I'm trying to say here is that when we mention accessibility to our businesses, clients, or stakeholders, mm. their immediate thoughts only process the 50 users who are physically disabled, like pretty evident to your naked eye, yeah. but fail to consider the other 850 users who who might not consider themselves to be disabled, but mm. are expecting support from your product or the surroundings to go through the complete experience. Right, that's and, true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and suddenly. when you try to put all these numbers and facts together the small percentage is no longer small right well yeah that's so true that is so true said and that that's actually uh, pretty interesting uh, because also when we rather let me let me frame the second question first right so one is obviously you know the part where we are saying the count is low uh, a when we say the count is low uh, i guess most analytics can't gauge that a uh, you know application has been accessed through a screen reader or so on and so forth there are some uh, statistics that give you but not all analytics give you that kind of information uh, that is the person using a you know assistance device or not now we can still convince okay you know there is a sizable population uh, but the flip card to that or the flip side to that that clients generally come back or even our teams come back with saying if we want to implement accessibility there is additional effort right so can we do that post our first go live and for me again that's a myth uh, but what are your thoughts on that say with this one also selesh i would say it's all about perception mm-hmm. so should accessibility really be treated as a separate task i don't think so you you might ask me why is that the case yeah. but a very a very simple answer to that would be because uh, it creates some false narratives when you list it out as a separate task Mm. let's try to understand some of them from a project standpoint okay when we list out our various tasks uh, involved in a project workflow every task is associated with three things mm-hmm. effort time and cost well yeah mm-hmm. so when we say we will have accessibility as a separate task then it looks like we are asking for additional effort time and cost which is usually not the case well yeah so yeah. it comes to us it it comes to us that we need to educate our clients or stakeholders that accessibility is part of the process it's part of the flow be it design or be it your code the only area where they will have to spend some extra bucks is to do some actual testing with some real users out there but again that cost will be a lot less when a user might actually sue you for not having an accessible well, site yeah. so that, that is why we as a group we have always been encouraging people to follow the accessibility first mantra hmm. you'll get to hear more about this from gautam very shortly but yeah that's my take on this super and in fact that that also brings up a very interesting perspective that when we look at a breakdown like you were saying right we generally have your story breakdown into different line items hmm. and we say okay you know if a task is taking two days my four hours is going to go on writing your html couple of hours on css a few hours on js and then we have a line item saying you know another three hours for making it accessibility compliant but we don't have a line item which says i i need another three hours to make my code performant right hmm. Right. Uh, because we don't say that i'll write a code which i will make it performant later right it is kind of implicit that when i'm writing i will write the most optimal performant code why can't we probably start building that same mindset saying you know when i start writing my code i will make sure that the code is accessible from the get go right that kind of takes away a lot of pain right and i guess uh, you know once we go through the coding exercise we'll also realize that it takes a lot more time and effort to write code which is non accessible and non compliant as compared to writing the right semantic and making the code compliant to begin with right, right. Yep. uh so yeah with that uh, gotham since you've been keeping mum i hope you're not bored uh but if you want to pick it up and uh, you know start with a few information and insights into the real world problems sure thanks uh selesh those were some really great insights uh selesh and sadat and i totally resonate with the thought that people are not disabled by their impairments they are disabled by poorly designed environments and with that i would like to start with one small trivia mm-hmm. i would like to request you all to close your eyes and now place your hands over your keyboard now with your eyes closed try to, to type something mm-hmm. do you feel your fingers are lost over the keyboard 
and yeah. you are unable to find the right key. This is a small example that shows how impairment prohibits people from performing simplest of tasks. Mm. But there is a very beautiful solution to this problem. And if you had taken the typing course, you'll probably know this. If you keep your left index finger on the key F and the right index finger on the key J and the rest of the fingers on the following keys, your hands are now in the proper typing position and with every key now accessible without moving your palm. So you will keep your hands on the same position and just moving your fingers, you'll be able to access every key on the keyboard. But how do you get visually impaired people to get their hands in correct position? So once again, keep your index finger on keys F and J and try to feel the keys. You will notice that there is a small embossing on the key. This embossing helps user to identify where to keep the, where to position the index finger. The mm. same embossing is also available on the numeric, pi, uh, numeric pad uh, on the key five. However, this helps people who have suffered visual impairment in later part of their lives. But people facing uh, visual impairment in early part of their life, they usually have a keyboard which have braille symbols on the keys to help them easily type. Mm -hmm. So that was that was really interesting, Gautam. As in, I even I didn't know about that to be very honest. Uh, but one more question around that: Are there any other devices like this uh, which are used as assistive technologies for disabled users? I can I can take that, Gautam. Um, and in fact, uh, so yes, there sir. are quite a few, and quite a few very interesting one. Not many people have seen it or experienced it because it's not widely available. It's it's generally for you know specific use cases. Uh, so let me share these four images and say, what's what's your take? How many of you have seen, have you seen or experienced with? Mm -hmm. I think I have only seen the second one, yeah. and I think it's a braille display. A braille I'm display, it looks like, yeah, sir. Well, yeah. yeah, that's 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 what it is. It is actually a braille display. But let me just walk you through the, these four different kind of devices, right? Uh, the one on your left uh, that you see is a keyboard designed specifically for people who only use one hand for typing. Now, these could be people which who have partial paralysis, can't have one limb functional, uh, but the keyboard is so designed so that the entire keyboard is easily accessed by placing your palm on the left bottom corner and being able to access and navigate through that entire keyboard. Uh, there is a similar, you know, uh, hand specific uh, keyboards that are available. So while this is optimized for your right hand, there is a similar one that you get for your left hand as well, right? Uh, the image next to it, like you both guessed that this is a braille display. This is more for reading what's displayed on the screen. And as your, as your focus moves from one uh, you know, component to the other, the content inside is, is kind of pushed through that wire and it's available on the braille for people to read. Uh, this also kind of goes back to how important it is to write the right semantic code for it to be functional. So if your mm. code is not accessible, the Braille won't draw anything. Right. Right. Uh, the next one that you see is for people who can't talk. Uh, so they can't use the screen reader, so to say. And they both they have both their hands non-functional. Right. Uh, so this is a keyboard and a stick specifically designed for them. Uh, you know, like the person holding the stick in the mouth uh, and you can poke it on the keyboard and type from that. Uh, and the tip is little significant that you can actually use the mouse pointer in case you want to uh, with that as well. Uh, again, you know, things that are pro provided for all kinds of disabilities. Uh, last but not the least, it's pretty interesting and pretty rare. Uh, it is called as a sip and a puff switch. Uh, so the way this works is uh, if you've seen, there's an entire pipe that gets connected with the person's mouth and it gets connected through a wire on the keyboard, right? Uh, this is generally used by people who have, uh, you know, complete paralysis, can't move the body, can't talk and stuff like that. Uh, but you can configure the actions on the keys by having specific actions of a sip and a puff on the tube. Uh, like, for example, if enter is the most common uh, key action that you use or search is the most common action that you use, you can configure it to like a two sips and a puff. And the keyboard gets configured accordingly. And you can start using the entire keyboard by combinations of different combinations of sip and puff by using this device. So yeah, so there are multiple options and those are very, very unique for different use cases. So yeah, that's that's it. That was insightful, Salish. So 
agree. you just helped us understand some tools which disabled users use in the real world out there now that's get, that uh, gets me to thinking and gautam i would like to know your point mm-hmm. of view on two things um how do you test your work for accessibility like on a day to day basis the tools that you might be using that's mm-hmm. one and the second one would be uh, how to do things the right way from a development standpoint so that we enable all these hardware based devices to do their job as expected okay sure uh, sadat uh, let me walk you through the process how by how i go about testing the accessibility of the website so what i have found uh, with my experience is the best way to do a accessibility testing is doing it through an assistive technology that people use in real life for this demo i'll be using voice over feature in mac it is a screen reading application that allows people with visual impairment to use uh, the computer easily and also browse through websites so let me just enable it so i'll click on this accessibility icon if you don't see it you can go to preferences and enable it and just click on voice over okay voice over has two modes one is it speaks uh, the text that uh, it is reading or it is able to interpret and the second it also shows that text on the screen so if you see on the bottom left corner of my screen this is how it shows uh, the audio feedback okay so it's kind of a transcript another trivia the users that are using voice over the use it in conjunction with another tool which is called rota so rota is able to scan through the accessibility tree of a website mm-hmm. which will cover in some time and is able to interpret important sections and other navigational information through the semantic tags and provides ease of access to the site okay so turning on uh, rota is easy once you have your voice over enabled just press caps lock and the u key on the keyboard and it shows you multiple ways how to navigate through a site so now you can see that uh, different ways so it shows all the form controls web spots landmarks articles uh, and uh, different headings form controls etc and links uh, which are there on the site so let's look at some of these so what we can see is there is there are multiple forms on the site and some of these forms are not even in the visible zone but because it's traversing through the accessibility tree which is again similar to dom tree but it is created by parsing the semantic information and through that uh, rotor is able to figure out that there are different form elements and we see that there is a form uh, somewhere on this page to subscribe to a newsletter had i been uh, using a keyboard i would have to tap through and listen through all the sections in the feed in the page and reach that form but using the rotor i am easily able to see that there is this form and i can go and easily subscribe it so i'll hit enter and it will take me directly to that form now uh, if you see the bottom left it was announcing that uh, vo- uh, voice over was announcing that i have landed on a form and it is asking me to enter an email id so once i enter the email id as i type you will also see the character that i am typing in the voice over mm. now as i hit tab key it tells me that there is a button and it is for sign up if i click this i'll get uh, enrolled so this is um, some of the best practices uh, 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 from the site and how people using assistive technologies uh, are able to browse through the sites now that we have seen a website with good accessibility implementation let's look at another example that has lack of best accessibility practices that i have seen uh, in different code review session and we'll will go through that okay okay yep. so first of all let's try navigating this site through keyboard as that is the primary input device for all the baseline assistive technologies mm. as i hit tab uh, i'll refresh the site as i hit tab we can see that uh, the focus is currently not visible where the site is going that's mm-hmm. mainly because at times people are uh, missing uh, on the uh, focus attribute there are a lot of libraries which override the value of focus in the css and at times developer forget 
that they have to override it and give a custom styling. So let's go and see the focus styling of the site. We see that the outline for this focus has been made as none. Mm -hmm. I'll go and give it some value. So we'll make the focus as um, one pixel dotted and we'll give it some variant color. We'll give it black color mm -hmm. and I'll save this file. We'll go back to the site, refresh the page. And now we can see, um, sorry, there is a, a outline that we can see coming across different elements. So even with the button, the focus is coming and you can customize the focus for each and every element uh, as need to be in the design. Okay. Okay. Now that we have seen the keyboard focus, let's run the router and see what all semantic information it is able to pull from the website. Hmm. So I will again, enable the voiceover. I will start the router. So we can see there is only one landmark, which is complementary. No other landmarks are identified. Mm -hmm. So let's go and uh, fix this. Let's, let's try to add some more landmarks to the site. Okay. So for that, let's go to the main. And this is the main section where we are showing all the products over here. We will change the stack to main tag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but you don't need to stop here uh, with the, every section that you define, it's important that you also define what that section means. So mm -hmm. how that can be done is using ARIA labeled by. Mm -hmm. Now labeled by needs ID of uh, an element present in the page. So right now, if we see the page, there is no element that uh, is uh, describing this page. So I can show you this page. There is no element that is describing. There are a list of products. Mm -hmm. So what we can do, we can actually add a heading for this page and we can say products and we can add the heading, uh, uh, an ID, which says page title because that's essentially describing the page mm -hmm. and that's why it makes sense to give it a h1 right now that we have seen this uh, this heading also gets visible to the user which may not be a requirement in design that you might not want to show it to the user mm -hmm. an easier way to keep results for screen readers but hide them from uh, from the screens uh, one way is you can use display none but Essentially, it will hide from the DOM and from the accessibility tree right. and also from uh, screen reader. So screen reader will not be able to read anything which is display none. Right. So there is a, a simple way. Most of the libraries that you are going to use in your project will have it implemented. We call it SR only class. So we'll add a class name as SR only. And if we see this class, I have added the code for this. Uh, what it is actually doing is positioning this element in a way that it is not visible to the user on the screen and it is not disrupting the flow of the web design, but it is still visible to the screen reader. So now if we refresh this page, we can see that heading is no longer visible and we'll run the voiceover again. And Mm -hmm. start the rotor, we can see that the products main is now visible as a landmark. Mm -hmm. right. So user using assistive technologies can now go and directly land onto the products. So this helps them identify different sections on the site. And you, if you have multiple sections, you can give use it with a side, you can use it with header, with footer. It's a very good practice and helps all the uh, users using advanced features of uh, screen readers. Now let's look at the navigation text and uh, let's, let's try to fix that. So right now we are not seeing navigation also. So we'll look at another example. So similarly on the navigation, we are not using any semantic tag. Mm -hmm. We are just using a div. So I'll replace this with nav. 
and nav essentially is a block level element it it works just like a div in your rendering flow but it has some semantic meanings to it mm. now uh, the other thing is while building navigations if you just put anchor tags inside a nav for some screen readers they give advanced functionalities like uh, uh, which they run on ul li elements where they allow you to count the navigation links that are there and skip them that will not be available so better way of designing a navigation is to have a ul li element wrapped to it so we'll just do it so we'll just put a ul i will just cut this put it at the end and i will put an li put this uh, li in the end and i'll move the key part from here to inside the li and we'll see um this navigation over here and we'll also add uh, a heading for it so maybe i can add a h2 uh main navigation and i can say that it has an id of uh main nav and i will again put aria described uh, labeled by uh main nav and again this text got visible so we missed adding screen reader only class so we'll say class name sr only and now we'll again enable voice over run the rotor and we see that the main navigation is now visible mm. right so what you're effectively saying is your semantic markup that we're talking about which html5 is uh, they're not just semantic they are also used as landmark tags yes and right. and we can see uh, we'll just explore in few minutes in accessibility tree how those semantic tags translate to mm -hmm. right because web was accessible even before those these semantic tags comes in these semantic tags actually came in just to improve uh, the web accessibility got it okay so now let's let's look at the rotor again let's try to see what all links can we see on the site and what all areas do we see uh, i'll start the rotor again so we have some links we have two headings coming in and it also tells what's the heading type h1 h2 and we see some of the form controls wow salesh you recognize this oh yeah my favorite <laughs> buy now buy now thing right so yeah a classic classic problem we definitely classic. need to know how do we solve this for sure yes and this is not the best part yet okay the best part is when i'll show you the code uh so this is again one of the examples where we talked about people over complicating the accessibility implementation so again these buttons are accessible you see uh, at least uh, to a screen reader user these buttons are visible they can tap through hit enter access them but still there is some uh, uh, way how it has been implemented is very chaotic let me show you that mm -hmm. okay so this is the code that you have to write to make a accessible buy now button because we are not using the semantic tag there is for building a button now what it is trying to do is because we created it using a div and a button needs to be keyboard focusable uh, we have added a tab index now because screen reader needs to know that it is a button we have added a role of button all the buttons are accessible on the keyboard input of enter and space we have added uh, a key down event to capture that and we also need to manage the click event so we have added a click event as well so all this code just to create a simple button and this is the reason why people feel that building accessible components is difficult and you will see similar markups coming up if you try to build custom element especially select box i have seen a lot of people building custom select box right salesh oh yeah many and <laughs> writing such elaborate fancy code just to get the basic thing done yeah 
and and you will never get the complete accessibility requirement done for it so true yeah <laughs> so it's always simple and easy to go with the semantic tags rather than going with custom functionality as this also improves lives for people who are using assistive technology so we'll just fix this problem so all this code that i have selected i'll remove it i'll put button tag and just before i remove everything i'll i'll show you the accessibility tree right now so that you are able to see the difference that it brings mm -hmm. so i'll put inspect element so when you inspect an element just in the uh, this sec secondary navigation you will see an option for accessibility see again this is also not prioritizing accessibility okay so over here there is a accessibility tree that we can see for this site yeah now right now because we are focused on the button it is showing me all the details of the button but we can see the entire accessibility tree of the site i'll collapse everything else and we'll see in more yeah. detail if you could probably zoom in a little more sure yeah this helps yes yes okay now we are able to see that there are different sections that we identified now because this was a div it was identified as generic but mm. we added a navigation tag inside it so we see in computation it says that role is navigation mm. had i not used the nav tag i had to manually go and add role as nav yeah and then it is able to detect the label for it through the label by and you can see in the name that the label that it will read for it is main navigation okay. right and uh, uh, again it has a heading it has a list right even though the heading was hidden uh, from the users it's still coming here and uh, and this is this is how it is uh, uh, made for different users and now let's come back to the button that we were talking about let's see what all uh, aria properties are defined for it i'll collapse the tree so we have role button mm -hmm. we have focusable true the uh, tab index that we had put on the div yeah. that made it uh, focusable true and we got the content through what was whatever the content was present inside that div the text node was able to provide us the content right now let's go back and fix this and we'll just change all of this code to simply a button and to that issue selesh where we saw uh, just buy now buttons we wanted to mm -hmm. see the product name as well i'll yeah. add the product name as well mm -hmm. so okay styles uh, sorry uh, it is product dot name mm -hmm. but this will be visible to everyone yeah i don't want it to be visible to everyone so what i'm going to do is i'll wrap it inside as our only class nice mm -hmm. well yeah this this also clearly proves uh, what we said earlier right that it's it takes a lot longer for us to write a code which is partly or not accessible as compared to writing something which is straightforward and accessible, accessible to go yeah. right yeah and you see we have a role button we have focusable true that's nice right and um, <clears throat> now let's let's check the rotor i'll enable the voice over again i'll do caps lock you okay uh okay it is still focused on this i'll put a focus back on my screen and do a caps lock okay now yeah. we see we have nice. buy now fresh kiwi green three piece button yeah suddenly everything starts making sense right right yeah. now i don't need to see how the site is i don't need to go tab 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 yeah i can use the rotor access the form elements i can click over here and add it to my cart super nice right okay so uh with this uh we have fixed some of the issues uh with the site gautam i had one question there this was great definitely as in um this was great but what we usually see with the e-commerce site is that we have a timer associated with our checkout flows in most of the cases 
so how do we tackle that situation wherein we let our users uh, who are using assistive technology know about the timer and its value because that is really important right because if they miss the timer then yeah i i i agree that's a very good question sada thanks for asking that and uh, because this is a use case of a component that dynamically updates the text Right. So, so for uh, everyone, let me just explain you this scenario in a bit more elaborate. Uh, so, let's say we have to update user every minute about the time remaining for the checkout, mm-hmm. right? And for a pe- person using assistive technology, let's say uh, that person is busy filling the form fields, and the screen reader is helping this user to fill the form by speaking out the field what the user is filling. So, during that time, when the user is not focused on the timer. the 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 keyboard focus is not there on the timer how do we make the screen reader speak the remaining t- time without changing the keyboard focus away from the input field that user is filling right so that's the actual problem statement so let's look at a example code that depicts this exact same problem so <clears throat> this is again a timer demo that we have created um uh, in this uh we can set a timer we can start the timer and it starts saying the time in seconds how much time is remaining now for a person using assistive technology if we uh, start announcing this time every second it it becomes very irritating so we need to announce it just when uh, uh, it is just for one minute right so every minute we announce it to a user how much time is remaining so how do we achieve this so let me take you through that so how we have built this component is let me take you through the accessibility part of that this component so we have created a form this form is labeled by a heading and uh, there is a label mm-hmm. uh, which is associated with this input using the for attribute mm-hmm. and the id then this input is of a very specific type number it helps people using assistive technology to announce that you have to enter a number type over there and what is the min ma- max value and step of it and a lot of screen readers are able to help users fill this information uh right and yep. uh, uh after this we have our component this is the the timer component now um i'll focus on this code for a bit so this is a code which i have put in which is there for screen readers only and over here i'm uh, showing how much time is remaining in minutes mm-hmm. but it's not visible on the screen because i am using screen reader only sir only right but i have added one interesting thing to it which is role is alert mm-hmm. so this component updates the state of uh, time remaining in seconds and uh, when this time Uh, gets updated in to a minute we just uh, show how many minutes are remaining okay. right so every minute mm. it updates the text and just adding this small line of code role is equal to alert it will help us announce this message any time uh, the screen reader we update this text even if the focus is on this field interesting okay so right. as i start the timer you will see that there is a announcement made over here saying that the timer is available for a minute i'll just start i'll just start it for 2 minutes so yeah. you see it says that time remaining is 2 minutes so once we have the time going back to uh, a minute we will see there is another announcement that will come even though my focus is on stop timer and we don't see the text uh, uh, that is Uh, controlling the minutes time we'll see that text coming right. in over here mm. and um, <clears throat> yeah i guess this is also like, a classic use case that we try and solve right that every time i do a add to cart <laughs> my mini cart is updated now how do i let the user know that there is something added to the mini cart right a classic use case right. Right. classic use case salesh thanks for bringing that one so yeah uh, again you just put a div whatever you get add whatever you add to the cart just publish that in the div and ensure that div has role is equal alert. to alert yeah nice. you know how many times i have heard people saying that you have to use something like alexa or they will write javascript <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we are just about nearing a minute 
All right. And time remaining is one minute. Superb. Nice. Right. right. So, so that's that's how uh, simple it is to build this feature. Now we'll also look at uh, the semantic part of it. I'll just select uh, this SR only span, mm -hmm. and we'll see what all uh, changes are there. So there is role alert as mm -hmm. we had put, but there are two additional properties this role adds. So there is a live region assertive and atomic uh, live regions is true. Mm -hmm. So what a live region assertive does is, uh, so, so uh, the role helps put these two values. So consider live assertive and as uh, something that forces the screen reader to suspend the current activity and announce the message coming through uh, the live. So whatever div or element that you have put in, that message will be announced. So let's say if I was focused on one of the field and screen reader was announcing that, it will stop uh, that announcement and force the new announcement that is coming in to be played to the user. So any important message that should be announced should be done via assertive. It is controlled via ARIA live assertive. Mm, okay. Right? And let's say we had a scenario where we were fetching some data in the background and we wanted to update the user that data is fetched. In that scenario, a better experience is to let screen reader complete the existing processing. Maybe a user is filling a field. Let's, let's not disrupt right. that flow, mm. right? Let's announce that once that processing is done. Let's, let's wait for that announcement for, you know, that the data is fetched to wait. Mm. In that case, yeah. you put ARIA live polite, right? Yeah. And uh, same thing, the atomic is essentially telling that the entire span that you are using is actually is an atomic unit. Mm. Super. It's like roles also have mannerisms, right? You go for like <laughs> exactly. It, it has manners and it will speak the entire thing. If uh, you are updating a text, because in, in our example, we were just updating the number, but entire text was uh, played wow. to the user. Yeah. And that's through ARIA atomic. If let's say we wanted to just update one, we would have put, uh, you could uh, actually override the value mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, atomic to false. In that case, it will just play the value that is changing. You can see in the DOM tree that this is a separate text node. Uh, right. So yeah. only this text node will be updated. <laughs> Otherwise the entire structure for the text nodes is, is uh, read to the user. And if I had to go and build this using JavaScript, it would be, uh, <laughs> let's not go there <laughs> <laughs> and then make it accessible. So true. <laughs> and then make it accessible. <laughs> All right. I think, uh, yeah, so that's, that's for the uh, coding live session part. I hope, uh, you liked and got benefited with this live session. Uh, these were few of the example that we discussed today and maybe in follow-up workshops, we can look at building an end to end example and, uh, try more, uh, ways of testing the accessibility, maybe on mobile devices, etc. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks for that insightful session, Gautam. That was, there were clearly some aha moments for me there, at least. Um, the insights into the semantics or what I will always refer to as landmark tags was equally great, actually. Landmark yeah. tags, that is something which was catchy as in, I didn't know that. And that's super, super, super useful. Yeah. So that was probably just a small demo of what one can expect, uh, from the series series of, uh, <laughs> workshops uh, and i hope people were able to gather some useful tips and tricks from the session which they can uh, start incorporating in their day-to-day -day activities but uh, thinking further on this selish what's next as in uh, processing all this information and trying to incorporate everything right from day one uh, might be a bit daunting task for everyone right so do you have any ideas for us on how to start with this mindset change some some ideas or insights around that maybe yeah, in fact, that's, that's something that I uh, started a couple of years back. Uh, and see, I mean, what we saw was more the how part of it, right? How do you fix something? How do you get something, get to something, right? Uh, it's even more important to know what are the challenges that a person goes through, 
right? To try and identify a fix for it, right? I mean, till you use a rotor, you would not even know, you know, there is a possibility like that, which we are not providing to the user. Right. So I guess step one is to do it yourself. Uh, so what I started, like I said, a couple of years back is following a no mouse Thursday, right? Uh, which is basically uh, as a conscious choice, every Thursday I give up using the mouse. I only use the keyboard to navigate the web. Uh, I tried using the voiceover sometime back. It's a lot easier than using the keyboard, believe me. Uh, because <laughs> when you get into sites, it's it's so annoying when uh, you know your basic implementation does not get focus, right? And you are struggling just to figure out how do you navigate. Uh, another classic issue I ran into was uh, when I was trying to browse through carousals, right? Mm. And there are a lot of implementations which give you a 360 rotating carousal, which is like an infinite scroll. I, I know if that you're using a keyboard, yeah, you are stuck inside the carousel because there's <laughs> no way of coming out after the last yeah. focus on the first one. So right. those real cases only come out when you do it yourself. So my my recommendation would be to try it out. Uh, don't go for a day as a target. It is daunting. Uh, it is super frustrating. So maybe start easy. Start with like spending an hour a day, probably once in a week just so that you get into that habit, inculcate that habit of using only the keyboard. Mm. Uh, that's when you understand the kind of challenges. And then when you are doing development, you naturally start thinking of those use cases and try to fix them upfront. Mm. So that's right. definitely helped. Uh, and then yeah, we obviously have, uh, you know, these two uh, URLs that are available, which give you a lot more insight. There are certifications that we can do uh, just to understand the dynamics of how accessibility works, how do you do testing and so on and so forth. And plus, uh, the next is also to join our workshops uh, as we will keep doing this over a series and we'll try and cover as many topics as possible. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's it. So that's what you can do. That's really helpful. Selesh. Yeah, these are some things which are not that tough to follow and we can definitely do in our day to day life. So, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, super. Right. So uh, moving on, probably the last leaving message before we have a couple of questions for our people just to a get feedback and also see what is it that you would want to hear more. I want to leave people with one message about accessibility that, you know, when you think about accessibility, don't think of it as standards. Don't think of it as a checklist that you have to follow. Accessibility is not about compliance, not about standards. It is actually about people. Right. Uh, you need to start to empathize. You need to start to relate with the kind of challenges that will, people will go through with the kind of implementations that you have done. And Salesh, I think there, there is a very interesting interest of people uh, of around using different screen readers. So today what yeah. we demoed was uh, a voiceover uh, uh, feature, which is available in Mac. That's right. True. So you can go and enable it. It's within the settings. It's you don't have to pay anything. It's mm. available out of the box. Unless you want to cover something around uh, what are the options yeah. for Windows? Sure, sure. Yeah, we have, uh, I, most people use JAWS. That's the default that people go with. Uh, and that works very well in tandem with your Edge and IE as a browser. Uh, if you're using Firefox, NVDA kind of goes really well with Firefox. Uh, you know, and your Android gives you a talk back. Like we said, iOS and Apple devices give you a voiceover is what you can use. Uh, so those are some of the screen readers you can explore. Um, yeah, at least get started, get into the habit of doing it. And all mm -hmm. all screen readers kind of behave differently. Uh, mm -hmm. So be okay yeah. that if you're using a voiceover, you're getting a certain experience with NVDA, you're not getting the exact same experience. That is obvious because all screen readers are designed in a certain way. They behave a certain way. So it's okay to expect different results from different screen readers. The idea is as long as things are accessible, you're fine with it. Yep. Right. And it's it's mainly about the empathy and the experience that you are giving right. to the user. Yeah, let's get started with the first question. Uh, look at this more like, uh, you know, if you were able to relate with any of the content that we presented, or if there is any feedback that you would want to give or something that you like, disliked of the whole session, uh, we would be more than happy to receive this as a feedback. And also, you know, anything that you were able to relate with. where we can find recordings, uh, we will publish that out. Um, we will try and check in the code in Git as well. Uh, in fact, uh, I think Gotham said one of the things we can do is probably convert this to a, you know, either a podcast or probably, yeah. uh, you know, convert this to a blog and share the code snippets with everyone. 
Right. Yeah, we can we can definitely do that, Salish. Okay. All right. Uh, we have some people who already knew everything. So in case you are interested in participating and sharing your knowledge in the upcoming sessions, please write to us. Uh, we can definitely learn from your ex experience. So, yeah. All right. So let's let's jump to the last question again. Anything specific that you would want us to cover in the upcoming sessions? Uh, we could probably build a complete uh, you know component which is accessible from ground up. Maybe yeah. something like a carousal. Like I said, that's one of the most painful points. Uh, we can do a complete dedicated session on accessibility testing. Look at the different yeah. kind of options that are available. Maybe even look at mm -hmm. from a tooling standpoint if there are any. Yeah, something like how clients. to go how to go like accessibility first design. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, that, we can also something. bring in our design team and you know do a quick session on how do you do designing for accessible experiences. Yeah. Last but not the least, something that I'm really uh, intrigued about, how do you write content, content which are accessibility compliant or with enhance your accessibility? Yeah. Right. So clearly hands-on session is something that people are definitely interested in. Uh, so good job, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Alish. Right. So the last minute efforts are paying off. Yeah. <laughs> Super. All right, great. Thanks everyone for this. Um, we will keep this on for a little longer. I'll just take it off screen. And in case people have any questions, uh, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, we'll probably try taking them up now. Uh, so Sid, if you sit, Gautam, if you can also look at the QA and uh, Q&A, and if, see if you want to answer some of them. All right, so there is one uh, Gotham, uh, which we kind of forgot to mention in the labeled mm -hmm. by, uh, it kind of specifically resonates to that saying, how do you handle translations? Uh, do you need yes. anything specific for a RTL uh, kind of accessibility testing? Right, so uh, uh, two things over there, I'll, I'll try to answer it in two ways. Uh, mm -hmm. One is when you are trying to uh, build a site, which is supporting internationalization, mm -hmm. uh, Testing the content is very important. What you are putting also images. Mm -hmm. The second part is from accessibility perspective. Uh, it becomes important that you should try and avoid ARIA label mm -hmm. because essentially ARIA label goes in as an attribute, uh, which is not translated. ARIA label by is actually referring to a DOM element, which can be read by all uh, the translations. So for example, uh, let's say if I'm using a site and I want to use a translation tool, maybe Google Translate to translate that site from one language to other, uh, the text that is going inside ARIA label, I won't be able to translate it. However, uh, labeled by is something which is present in the DOM, key, DOM node and uh, will be easily translated uh, by the tools. So labeled by is actually preferred in that scenario. So uh, whenever you are thinking in terms of internationalization, uh, try about that. Sure. So there is one more, uh, Sid Gotham, uh, again, since these are all the topics that we discussed on what should we, what should we not cover. So maybe something that is right up our road, we kind of have answers for it. It says any suggestions for using a select dropdown as most of the clients ask for a inconsistent design across browsers or rather they want a consistent design across browsers how do you handle you know that kind of request yeah that's uh there was a very beautiful site that yeah. was <laughs> that i saw uh some time back it says should my website look exactly same on all the browsers and it had just one word no yeah we are living in an era of progressive enhancement and graceful degradation and we are trying to give better experience for the browsers, which are supporting your functionalities and uh, saying that my sites should look exactly same as like, I need to support offline in IE 11. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess right. yeah, the short answer is, you know, we need to educate our clients. There is no other way around it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, things will look different across different browsers and we should also look at it from a practical sense that, uh, if I am using your site on edge, I will not open it parallelly in Safari and say, okay, you know, your, your site is not looking consistent. That's not how use, end users behave. If I am using Safari, I will continue to use Safari. And if there are subtle differences, 
I will not even know that it's looking different as compared to any other browser because that's not my intent. I'm here to shop. I will shop and I'll leave rather than looking at comparison saying, oh, your site is not pixel perfect. I'll not shop on your site. Yeah. <laughs> so take it with a pinch of salt, but that's what you need to do. There's one more question. Uh, I don't know if you've covered that. It is, what is the use of HTML microdata in context of accessibility? Uh, microdata was essentially created for uh, search engines to get uh, uh, more contextual information from the site, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's that's the essential main purpose of it. Uh, I would still fall back to using semantic tags and attributes for uh, accessibility because uh, what accessibility is about it's not about getting the context of the site; it's about browsing the site. Right, how a person will be able to browse a site and uh, gather the information. For a search engine, it's still easier to get the information from microdata. So, uh, again, there are a lot of uh, developments going on with different screen readers and they try to update themselves. So, maybe there might be a screen reader that will go read about the microdata, but how it will pronounce us because you need a way to navigate to it. So think of uh, right now, we just talked about uh, two ways of navigating, like a mouse and a keyboard or some other input devices, which essentially translated into a keyboard. But there are other ways how people can navigate. For example, there is a, a dragon tool that is being used uh, to uh, use voice commands to control the system. Right. So people, for example, we saw a scenario where a person uh, who didn't have the hands was using a stick in his mouth uh, to type the letters on uh, through the keyboard. But uh, the alternate is they can also use something like uh, a software that essentially take voice commands and uh, does the uh, controls the computer. Yeah, correct. Right. So you have actually uh, projected the uh... The site that we were referring to, it says, yes. do websites need to look exactly the same in every browser.com? And the only word that it has is no, right? <laughs> so kind of get the essence from that, right? Uh, so cool. I guess we are pretty much on time. So thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, thank you for all the feedback. Uh, and we will send out invites for the next one. Uh, thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone.